So, again, hello, my name is Ronald. I'm the host of today. I'm the co-founder of Bug Fraud, and I'm very happy to host this webinar today. We're going to talk about location spoofing. Before I'm going into all the details about who's joining us today, about the webinar itself, I have only one housekeeping rule. Please engage, please use the chat box on the right hand side uh, to ask questions, make comments. We have two great experts uh, joining us today, which can provide a lot of details and insights about this very interesting topic about location spoofing. Okay, then let's see who's joining us today. So we have Andrew from Incognia and we have Scott from CNP Mentors. Andrew, please give the audience a short overview of who you are, what are you doing, that everybody knows who's joining us today. All right, thanks, Ronald. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Andrew Faraz. Uh, I'm CEO and co-founder at Incognia. I uh, started my career as a security researcher about 12 years ago, um, particularly working on IoT security, trying to build new authentication protocols for, for IoT networks. Um, and, and from there, uh, since, since then, I have been um, working a lot with location in particular, uh, because as part of that research project, uh, I started leveraging location signals as a way to authenticate users to uh, IoT devices. Um, so happy to be here, uh, excited to talk about location spoofing uh, and location spoofing detection more importantly, uh, given this is a, an increasingly important topic when it comes to mobile. Um, so happy to be he here uh, and to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome. Scott, your turn. Hey guys, Scott Adams, um, CMP Mentors. So yeah, I've been doing, you know, front and risk payments for the last 20 something years with video game companies like Riot Games and uh, consulted for tons of merchants in different verticals. And so, you know, CMP Mentors were trying to basically just educate the population, um, ideally getting people the knowledge they need to process payments and credit cards and fight fraud. Uh, but, you know, it's really not out there right now other than in events. And so I'm excited to speak here with Andre about uh, location because that's such a big problem in fraud right now. Thank you, Scott, for joining today. Um, also, a few words about myself. Um, so I also have been in the fraud payment industry for quite a while, working for big merchants, for example, like Booking.com and other industries. Uh, I'm running together with my co-founder, PJ, since over five years about fraud. We are a global fraud fighter community and organizing this kind of webinars to educate our audience in different subjects and let's say the, the whole topic about location is really an increasing topic and especially on mobile and that's why I'm really happy to have this panel today um, to give to the broader audience a bit more perspective what's going on, uh, what are the type of uh, fraud schemes and on the right hand side you can see a few topics which we're going to cover but again just want to highlight again please ask questions. Uh, it's always good if you add your perspective that we really can engage with the right topics to make this as interesting as possible. And as you can see, we all have a few slides prepared. So it's really about having a chat and not really having only a slideshow. So let's jump directly into the topic, Andrew. Um, there are different use cases. And I think here we picked a few use cases where are you focusing, especially as a company, uh, to understand where is the fraudster and also understanding the impact for these different um, industries? Awesome. Yeah, uh, as I've mentioned, I've been working with location technologies for quite a while now, um, for about 12 years. And, and since then, uh, like, uh, I realized that location was uh, not being explored at, at its full potential, basically, when it comes to fraud prevention, right? So most platforms, most uh, uh, people in the industry, they, they leverage location in some way, in most cases using uh, the, the location that is provided by the IP address, right? In some cases, they also use the GPS 
Um, but usually the, the use cases are, are quite basic, right? So you're basically trying to identify, for example, if the user is logging in from a new country, which is probably unusual, or if the, the distance uh, from the last login to, to the current um, authentication event is, is very far, um, but not really to analyze the user's behavior in more detail, right? So um, what's, what's particularly interesting and newsworthy is that I think two weeks ago in April, uh, by the end of April, uh, Apple has announced uh, that they're starting to employ location as a mandatory signal for fraud prevention on Apple Pay. And what's particularly interesting about that news is that, um, well, as we know, Apple owns the device, right? So, so they have basically the best device identifiers that are that are uh, possible to get. They they own the hardware. Um, so, so basically they, they already start in that game with a huge advantage on top of that, as we know, Apple has also pretty sophisticated biometric, uh, technology using face ID, for example, that uses, uh, some infrared signals to create a 3d model of your, of your face. And still they decided to employ location as a mandatory signal, which means users don't even have a choice to say, I don't want to share location with Apple to use Apple pay um to to prevent fraud so so this brings uh some insight on how location could be leveraged for for some of these use cases but going a little bit more specific here um we we can see some of the ways that fraudsters are using location spoofing um to to commit different types of fraud right so so the problem here when it comes to location is spoofing location is very very easy right so if you're using for example ip-based geolocation uh the fraudster can use proxies vpns uh tor exit nodes etc uh so so basically there are multiple ways in which a fraudster can can hide their true location uh if you rely on, on ip-based geolocation if you're using gps uh, the user also has many other ways uh, to, to spoof location, which we're going to talk a little bit more later in this presentation. Uh, but basically, it's very accessible. And given that this is accessible to fraudsters, they're using these tools uh, to commit different types of fraud. So on, in online gaming, for example, uh, one of the things we, we see more commonly is users using location spoofing uh, to collude and to, for example, uh, change the, the dynamics of, of a game. So let's take a, a, a poker game, for example, right? Um, if, if you have a poker game with five people and four out of those five are together and, and playing as a team, right? The fifth pe person is, is going to uh, definitely lose some money in, in that game, right? But how does the fraudster makes it... Uh, in, in a way that the gaming company is not able to perceive that that type of fraud is going on, right? They're basically using location spoofing. So they're going to use, for example, multiple devices, maybe three or four, um, or maybe they're with, with a partner, right? One of them is in a, in a specific location. Let's say that they are in, in the East Coast of the US. Uh, the other fraudster uh, is right there with them but they use location spoofing to say that they are in a different country. Let's say that they, they, they would try to spoof their location to show uh, as, as if they were in England. Uh, and then there is a, a third fraudster that is right there in the same room, but is also using location spoofing to say that they are in Germany, right? Um, for the gaming company, if they don't have very strong location spoofing detection, it would seem like a very normal game, right? The reality is that the the fifth person there on that table uh, is is being fooled and losing money um, because of that scheme, right? So so that's one of the issues when it comes to online gaming. Uh, the use of location spoofing can lead to this type of behavior, right? Um, another thing which is not not exclusive to online gaming is also fraud farms, right? So um, people can be using multiple devices or or even even emulators to emulate multiple devices. Um, to, to commit different types of fraud, right? So to open multiple accounts, to um, log into multiple accounts doing, doing account takeover. Uh, so, so location spoofing is a way also to hide that there are multiple devices concentrated in a single location, right? 
So, so by detecting location spoofing, you can eventually see that there are multiple devices that are uh, working together um, in, in a single place. And then finally, uh, for some specific industries like online gambling, for example, or skill, skills-based uh, gaming, uh, there are some regulations that are tied to some specific jurisdictions. So, for example, in the United States, you have states in which gambling is allowed, states in which it's not. So, for example, right here we have uh, California on one side in which online gaming is not allowed. But uh, if you cross the border and you go to Nevada, Nevada is the state in, in, in which um, uh, Las Vegas is located, right? So it's definitely allowed. Um, and, and because of a few meters, uh, the gaming company can be in non-compliance uh, because of that. So, so fraudsters might, may use location spoofing also uh, to be able to play some of these games. So let's say a person in California can use location spoofing to say that they are in Nevada. They'll be able to access the game uh, and, and play uh, even if it's not allowed uh, in that jurisdiction. So, so online uh, gaming in general um, faces different different issues when it comes to to location spoofing. Um, another industry that is highly impacted by by location spoofing is delivery. Right. So when you're uh, ordering food online, uh, there are multiple drivers out there, uh, and in some cases, these drivers they would use. Uh, fake GPS technology or, or location spoofing technology to basically like get more orders, right? And, and by doing that, uh, they might be able to make more money. But in, in reality, they're not even going anywhere, right? Uh, and that, that can create a lot of problems. Um, same applies to ride hailing. Uh, so, so that's another issue. And then finally, in the social and dating space, uh, there are also multiple issues related to fraud, right? Uh, as, as we've seen recently, uh, there was a, a Netflix documentary uh, called The Tinder Swindler, for example, in which basically uh, this guy was was using dating platforms to scam people. And this is a very normal, normal issue, right? Um, location is, is also a mandatory signal for these dating apps. So Tinder, for example, you cannot use Tinder if you don't enable location services. Uh, but then fraudsters are able to use location spoofing uh, to, for example, um, say that they are in a, in a high net worth area, for example, um, and and by doing that, uh, getting access to contacts to people that uh, that they're not close to, and once they establish that relationship, uh, they're able to to commit uh, their their crimes and and their uh, scams. So. So there are multiple ways uh, in which location spoofing can be leveraged to commit fraud. But I, I'd say that the, the bottom line here is that at the end of the day, the fraudster doesn't want to show their true location, right? So if the app relies on location services, uh, the fraudster is going to do whatever they can uh, to hide their location. Otherwise, it would be easier to catch them. Yeah. I think we can already see in this kind of kickoff slide that uh, location is really an important element for, for many businesses. And as you explained, there are many avenues for fraudsters uh, to use different locations to gain an advantage. Um, but also maybe getting from uh, Scott's perspective, I mean, you also deal with a lot of uh, video gaming perspective and different areas where location also matters from a different angle. Um, and I think also an important point to understand, it's not often only about fraud. Sometimes it's more a policy abuse, for example, or other ways how someone uh, is maybe uh, spoofing a location. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think um, for video games, one of the problems, some game companies, not all of them, but a lot of them will they, they really want everybody to be able to play, you know, everywhere in the world. And especially as we have more and more of these platforms that try to cater to everybody and let everyone play in the same environment. When you want that adoption, you have to think about the currencies, right? And so if you go, like, say, to South America, where some of those currencies are valued so much less than the dollar, and, you know, it might be you think here it's five dollars. So that's that's fine. No big deal. But there that five dollars in USD might be you know, a week's pay. And so some companies will make it so that, you know, the currency that the person buys in the game is different prices per region. 
And so it sounds like a wonderful idea until you realize, like Andre just told us, how easy it is to spoof. Um, and most companies don't even think about that. And so they don't even need to really spoof. They can just do something simple about a VPN. Um, you know, someone just actually asked what a VPN, VPN is. And, you know, that's just basically a way there's proxy and VPN both allow you to log in, you know, on your computer, wherever you are, and make it look like it's somewhere else. So it kind of redirects your traffic through that other, um, you know, through another computer, through another network. And then that's where it looks like you're coming from. And so, you know, with that, like, you know, like the example I just gave, if someone does that and there's no detection for it or there's no system like this one, then, you know, you can buy the, uh, the virtual currency super inexpensively. And then you basically just do arbitrage and then you can sell it if, the, if that's allowed. Or, you know, oftentimes we'd see, um, especially with video games, but a lot of other companies too, where they'll create fake accounts or just accounts. And then they load them using, you know, either currency that they've arbitraged, they've gotten cheaper somewhere else or with stolen credit cards and then sell that. So there's all sorts of ways for them to make money. Um, and it's like, it is really very simple to, to make it look like you're coming from somewhere else. I would like to maybe in general going one step back. I think all of us working in the fraud space are using IP to a certain extent already since a long, long time. I think even basic uh, fraud solution providers or uh, payment providers using IP for velocity checks or for, let's say, other uh, simple um, rules. Um, I think it's good maybe to explain a bit more to the audience. Um, would a, a, a merchant use still like an IP and looking about detecting a VPN or a tour network and using something like you offering entry or would that replace what someone is using today? So how would that work together? Because sometimes what I feel talking to merchants is they see so many different things, but often it's difficult to get all these things together and really making sense across all the data because sometimes a signal could be good and sometimes a signal could be completely misleading in a different direction, especially if you combine it with uh, device data and maybe other, uh, let's say, elements to, to get a, a profile about your customer. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's a very important topic. Uh, and, and I say this all the time to customers. Like, for example, if if you are planning to leverage location as as a as a fraud prevention signal, you can only do that if you are sure that like you have access to very good location spoofing detection technology. Otherwise, given that like it, it is very accessible and easy for fraudster to, to spoof location, uh, that signal is actually going to be detrimental to your business, right? If, if you leverage it and you don't have lo good location spoofing detection, that means that you basically created actually a security vulnerability uh, in, in your, your solution, right? So. Um, before using not only location, but any signal, right, for, for fraud prevention purposes, you need to make sure that you can trust that signal. And historically, that's one of the main reasons why location has not been leveraged as a major signal, just as like one on top of many others, uh, basically because uh, like so far that there was no uh, like very good and, and, and very reliable uh, location spoofing detection technology out there um, when it comes to to ip versus gps versus other location signals um, it, it really depends on the platform right so for example when we're talking about a browser environment uh, you're not able to access the same apis that are available for a native mobile app right so on a native mo mobile app for example you can access not only gps signals but you can access for example Wi-Fi signal, so you can scan like the, the nearby Wi-Fi routers. Uh, you can access information about Bluetooth signals as well. And even some other sensors like accelerometer, gyroscope, that can give you an idea of movement uh, from that user, right? Most of these signals are not available in the browser environment. So you're usually restricted to just the IP address. In some cases, you can access through HTML5, uh, some some more accurate geolocation information that is provided by the browser, uh, but it, it it will never be as good as a mobile uh, app, right? Um, 
So depending on the platform, you're going to use these type of signals in different ways. Uh, like for our service in particular, we, we only work for mobile uh, applications. We don't have a solution for, for browser applications, basically because of those limitations when it comes to the data that is available for you to locate the user accurately. Um, on a browser environment, my recommendation here is if you have some overlap between your browser user base and your mobile user base, you can leverage the signals from the mobile app and transforming the mobile app as, as kind of an authenticator application for your, for your browser application. But if, if there is no significant overlap, um, actually my recommendation here would be to uh, make sure that you have access to a good database of IP addresses um, and, and that they, they do uh, a, a pretty diligent work on identifying uh, spoofed IP addresses that are trying to, to hide the user location, trying to identify also VPNs and proxies and things like that. On the mobile environment, use as many data points as possible. Uh, if you can get access to, for example, Wi-Fi signals, you should leverage that. If you can get access to Bluetooth signals, you, you should leverage that on top of GPS. Uh, but again, there's quite some uh, development work. Fraudsters are quite creative. So once you you find a very, very robust solution, they're, they're going to find a way to circumvent it. Um, so ideally, uh, you work with vendors that really have uh, specialized in, in working with these signals uh, so, so you can um, get access to best technology available and the most up to date. Yeah, that's something just to compound what he said is that, um, you know, I always recommend that merchants, if they need, you know, location, if it's important to them to, to make sure that, you know, you don't really want to probably home grow a device ID solution or a location solution, because it really, is, it's an arms race with fraudsters, you know, in every way, really, you know, we develop a technology at the merchant level or at a merchant provider level, but then they have whole businesses fighting us. And so, you know, I think the better, you know, find a solution that works for you and, you know, let them fight that war. And then that lets you focus on what you're actually, you know, what you're good at building your company and providing your service or your, your products. Hmm. But I would say in general, I think there is a trend that even big merchants trying to build in-house technology less and less. I mean, in the past, I've seen companies create in-house device fingerprint solutions, et cetera. But, but I don't see this this often anymore. I mean, maybe the big, big ones, maybe they still uh, do this like the apples of the world, yes. Uh, but I think all the others, I think they are more than happy to leverage existing networks because at the end, if you have your own device fingerprint or own location uh, service, you only see your own customers and you're missing out the whole network which a provider is actually giving you access. I think that's definitely... I mean, I mean, that, that applies for many different services, but I think that's one big benefit, having a provider in place and, and tapping into a network. Um, I have a few more questions, but I think uh, in the next slide, um, we uh, pointed out a couple of ways how fraudsters um, spoofing location. And I would like to maybe adding one layer on top and just trying to understand, Andrew and, and Scott, from your experience, I mean, an IP, back to the IP topic, a lot of uh, companies don't really use the IP as a very strong signal anymore because they know uh, the IP is obsolete in a very short time. So it's not really a reliable uh, signal which you can use over time. Uh, so, so how strong is the uh, location information? Is it more reliable over time? Or is it also obsolete to every short and you need to really generate a new uh, location fingerprint or location uh, profile of your users? Maybe that's something to add on top for this slide to have a discussion. Well, I'd say real quick, one thing on you know, IP. If you know, the viewers out there, if they're still using IP as a major source of anything, remember too that you know, as we get more global, you know, most of your companies probably are trying to not be just USA centric, right? And if that's the case, you got to remember most companies, most countries, most ISPs out in the world, it's very dynamic. You know, I like to remind people that, you know, like as a someone from the United States, we tend to be really US centric and think everybody's like us and they're not. 
Um, you know, especially in that way, like in my IP, even though it's technically dynamic, hasn't changed in a year, you know, maybe more. Whereas when I've dealt with other, other countries, which is where a lot of my, my work is, it can change daily. It can change by the hour. And so really IP almost is worthless to you. Um, and that's where I think in a lot of ways, device IDs replace that, you know, but just like we just said, and Ronald just said, you don't want to do that in house because then you're, you don't have the network effect. You don't see and you're also, you're, you're not focused on building that device ID and keeping it, it great, whereas companies that provide it do. Yeah, one, one thing that's also um, particularly interesting about IP, um, and, and another reason not to rely so much on it, is, is that Apple recently introduced some changes to, to their uh, platform. So they're starting to randomize IP addresses uh, to, in, in order to, to protect users' privacy. Uh, but that has a direct impact on on fraud prevention platforms that rely on on IP addresses. Uh, so, so yeah, when it comes to location specifically, uh, I never recommend relying on IP-based geolocation because uh, it's so easy for the fraudsters to spoof it. That even if you have access to the best available database um, and, and the most up-to-date uh, database, fraudsters are constantly finding new ways to to spoof it. So. Um, it, as, as Scott said very well, like it, this is a, a, an arms race with the fraudster. Uh, don't try to build it, this in-house because it's not a one-time thing. It's not like, okay, I, I, I've built location spoofing detection capabilities internally. Well, you're going to have to maintain that. You're going to have to keep a team to work in that 24-7 because the day the fraudsters identify that you're using something like that, they're going to try to find ways uh, to, to bypass it. So. Uh, it's it's a constant battle. Um, I, I highly recommend relying on other signals if you want to leverage location for fraud prevention purposes. Um, and particularly when it comes to mobile, as I've mentioned before, like you have access to to so many additional sensors uh, other than the the uh, GPS, uh, and and you can use all of those sensors to locate the the user's device with higher precision. So, for example. One of the things we do at Incognit is we, we create what we call a location fingerprint, which is equivalent to, to a, a device fingerprint, but for a location, right? So basically, uh, let's say that this location here uh, was never mapped by our technology. Uh, the moment that a, a device that uses one of the apps that, that use our technology arrives at this location, we're going to recognize new signals, right? So we're going to see like multiple Wi-Fi sensors from, from my house, from my neighbors, um, and, and from people that, that, that live nearby. Um, and these signals are unique to this location, right? So you're never going to see the same MAC addresses from these Wi-Fi routers anywhere else, right? So basically we create a fingerprint for this particular location, combining all of those signals uh, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. So there's a, a Bluetooth speaker right here that also uh, can be mapped to this location, right? There is like my, my airports are, are here, I uh, have a smartwatch that also has a Bluetooth connection. So all of those signals can be matched to a specific location um, and can be used to make sure that the, the, the location is true. Uh, but when it comes to to location spoofing techniques here, uh, other than proxies, VPNs, and, and, and Tor, for example, to spoof IP addresses, there are other ways to spoof the GPS information as well. I really don't understand why, but both Apple and Google, uh, they have enabled applications to use their API uh, to basically change the GPS coordinates. So any app have those capabilities. So if you go to the App Store or if you have a, a, an Android device and you go to the Play Store, you can do it right now, by the way. Uh, you can search for fake GPS. If you search for that, you're going to find multiple apps that basically enable you to change the GPS coordinate very easily. You don't have to, to have like root. You don't have to jailbreak your device. You don't have, a, have to be a specialist on, on like a, a, a specialist hacker. Uh, you just go to the App Store and you download one of these apps and you, you, you build those capabilities right now. So it's very easy, very accessible. Um, but other than, than those uh, GPS spoofing apps, you also have other tools like emulators, uh, instrumentation tools. There are some uh, apps that also allow you to temper 
with the code of with the source code of, of another application, uh, you can use all of those techniques to spoof locations. So so that's why this is um, easy to do for the fraudster, but on the other hand, it's hard to detect, right? Because there are multiple ways in which fraudsters can do that. Um, so so yeah, that's some of the 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 things we've been seeing uh, that that fraudsters are doing to hide their location today. I mean, uh, we also got one question in, but which I think is in general interesting. And also you touched this, uh, Andreas, about privacy. I mean, you mentioned that now you can actually, based on your location, detect so many different devices which are connected uh, or part of this location. Um, is this something uh, which is somehow similar around the world? Or is this for you as a provider and for customers merchant using this technology is something to keep an eye how they need to apply this in the different markets um or is somehow right now not that hardly regulated so you can just take all the information and uh, using this in a i mean there's a purpose behind to detect fraud i think that's already good um but maybe it's good for the audience to get some general um overview uh, how much this is impacting any kind of usage of such technology. Perfect. Yeah. Um, when it comes to location data, um, like as we've mentioned, we you, you can get to it in different ways, right? For IP-based geolocation, uh, you, you can simply get access to the IP. You don't have to ask the user for, for permission. Um, so, so that's easier, but as we've mentioned, uh, it's not the best data source, right? If, if you want to use it for this purpose. Uh, when it comes to GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of these other signals that I've mentioned, you need to ask for permission, right? So, so the mobile application is going to ask, would you uh, enable this app to access your location? Uh, if the user says yes, then you can uh, access that information. And usually, depending on the platform, on iOS, for example, uh, Apple, um, they, they ask for uh, different, um, f like the, the different ways in, in which you would share location. So you can share all the time, or you can sh share only while using the app, or only once, for example. Um, so it really depends on the app. It really depends on the industry. Uh, so, for example, for the online gambling industry, as it is a mandatory thing because uh, it, it is uh, due to the, the regulatory environment, uh, all of these apps are going to ask the users and, and the user don't have the choice to say, no, I don't want to share this data and still play the game. Right? You have to share because you have to comply with the, the uh, regulations. Uh, for other applications, that's optional, right? So, for example, in the financial services industry or in the food delivery industry, uh, when you download one of these apps, they're going to ask you for location. But if you say, no, I don't want to share, uh, you can still use the application, right? Um, so our recommendation, if you want to rely on this type of data, is first of all, to be very explicit with your user saying that you're going to use location for fraud prevention purposes uh, for the user's account protection, right? The reason why I say this is when we uh, see customers that simply ask for location uh, with a very generic message saying like, oh, I'm, I'm the bank here, I want to access your location, the opt-in rates are very low. It's usually like 20% or 40% or lower. Um, but never, never above 50%. Once we see these apps being explicit, saying, I'm going to use location to protect your account, we usually see 90% plus opt-in rates, right? So uh, it's, it's a very small difference in the messaging, but that results in, in a much higher opt-in rate just because at the end of the day, like the user, they understand that uh, if they're reading that and say, well, the bank is asking for my location information and, and they're saying that they're going to protect my account by doing that. Uh, it's a much better value proposition than simply, oh, my bank wants to know where I am, right? Like it's not, uh, if you don't know why they're going to use that data, um, it's it's harder to uh, for, for users to decide to share, right? So, 
So that's my number one recommendation. If you want to use location, you have to be transparent with your user. You need to make sure that the message is clear that this data is going to be used to protect their account. Um, and, and if you do so, uh, the chances are that you're going to see like usually 90% plus up in rates. Yeah, uh, thanks, Andre. Um, I think uh, an interesting question came up from Jake. Uh, he made a statement, in my experience, particularly for FIs, uh, we were blocking this login attempts when emulated uh, were in use. Uh, is this something which you could confirm for, for your experience, Andre? For DFIs, if they detect emulators, they would just not allow a login? Or how would companies use this information? I mean, again, it goes back to my initial point before, you can detect a lot of signals, um, but not everybody is always be able to use the signals in the right way. Uh, so would you give recommendations to someone if you detect an emulator? just plug the login, or is it up to your customer using the data which you provide in a specific way? Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, so it, it really depends on the industry. For FIs, for example, we see that most of our customers, uh, when, when we share that we have detected the use of emulators, they usually block the login. Uh, this is not our decision. We, we just provide a recommendation, right? So when we detect a, a, an emulator, for example, we're going to share with the customer on our API response that this is a high-risk event because we have detected an emulator. Uh, but we see in other industries, for example, that, that some, some companies are allowing users to, to keep using uh, the application, even if they are in an emulated environment. Personally, I would block everyone that's using an emulator because I, I agree, like I, I, I don't believe that there is a, a legitimate use of emulators, especially because like smartphones are, are quite accessible today. Everybody has it. So why, why is someone trying to uh, access an application using an emulator, right? It, it, it's even more convenient to use it right here. Um, so personally, I would also block all emulators, but as I've mentioned, like it's, it's not our decision. So we see some companies um, enabling users to uh, to use emulators. What's particularly interesting, though, is is that um, for financial services uh, companies, uh, we, we see a very high correlation between the use of emulators and and new account fraud. Um, so, so that's why our recommendation is, is, is to block it right away, but because that's, that's a way to streamline the process of opening fake accounts, right? So you, if, if you're using an emulator, you can run, uh, multiple instances at once on the same device. Uh, so, so that's a problem. App tampering, by the way, is another thing that we're, we're seeing, uh, it, it, it becoming an, an in, pretty significant problem. So, so basically, um, it's, it's pretty much the same thing as, as an emulator, but you use your mobile device and you can clone different instances of the same application and tempering those. So, so you can like manage multiple accounts from the same device uh, and, and also spoofing the device ID. So detecting app tempering is, is as important as detecting em emulators as well. Before we jump into the next slide, maybe looking ahead, looking into the future, Andre, do you see any new ways which are coming up right now or due to whatever Apple is changing, new devices? Uh, do you see any kind of new uh, avenues how fraud is coming in maybe next year or in a few years? Yeah, well, there is a, a concerning change. So over the past two years, um, we, we have observed mostly uh, like fraudsters scaling up their uh, social engineering techniques. So basically like automating as much as possible using like, for example, chatbots uh, to automate um, uh, like phishing campaigns via social media and, and other channels. Um, but more recently, uh, one of the things we, we started seeing was, was actually physical attacks, the rise of physical attacks, especially in emerging markets. Um, so, so as an example, uh, in, in Brazil, the central bank over there has released a new payments um, 
method called PIX, which stands for instant payments, basically, uh, which provides real time payments. So it's it's not like um, the, the three to five day ACH settlement, like it's it's in real time. So what's going on out there is, is that um, there is a, a significant increase in physical attacks. So people are literally like stealing your phone uh, while it is unlocked. Right. So so that's that's the, the tricky part. Like when you are, for example, in a concert and you're like taking a picture uh, uh, right there, uh, like there, there are people just grabbing your phone and running away. And once they do that, the issue is your phone right now is usually a single point of failure if it, it is unlocked, because, for example, the account recovery methods like uh, resetting a password will usually use either your email address, right? So they're going to send you an, a, a link to your email and, th and that email is already logged into that device, right? Or they're going to send you a link via SMS. Um, so, so the phone is right there in the hand of, of, of the fraudster. Uh, they start the, the process to reset your password. They reset your, your password on, on the banking app. Um, the phone is already authorized, so the device ID is still the same. It's all good, right? Um, and and then you you log into the bank account. You do an instant payment right there. You send all the money that's present on, on that account to someone else instantly, and it's it's irrevocable. So so you can there is no chargeback, right? You can't go to the bank and say, hey, I I, I want my my money back. No, there's there's nothing like that. So. Uh, that's that's a growing trend that we're seeing in in basically markets that are uh, implementing faster payment uh, methodologies using mobile. Um, so that's that's a concern. The way we're addressing this, uh, particularly with location, is that we're basically creating um, like a, a, a profile for each user based on where they typically uh, would would move money from, um, and then we're setting dynamic limits for for transactions right so if you're at home for example uh you can send as much money you want right if if you want to like send a million dollars to someone you can do that the moment you step outside your home uh we already drop that limit to like 10k for example um so so we're automatically setting limits for for transactions based on location because one of the things we've learned is that about 95% of the high risk financial transactions that happen on mobile apps occur from places that are frequented by that user at least once a week, right? So that would be your home, your office, basically places that are part of your, of your life. Uh, so if, if we consider that, uh, the users can still have the convenience of instant payments, uh, but reducing the risk when they are outside, for example. And I think you picked a really interesting topic with PIX. And also for the audience, we, as about fraud, we're going to launch an article about PIX fraud, I think, uh, next week. I'm also highlighting on this topic. I think also the central bank actually started some specific rules that at night you cannot do a PIX transaction anymore. They're really trying to uh, minimize the exposure. But it's definitely uh, an interesting way um, how technology is also uh enabling fraud or kind of different avenues of fraudsters to take advantage exactly I, think that's I, I do a lot of work down in brazil and pix has become everybody uses it like it doesn't it's, it's it's really it's actually really neat to see because you know it's so hard here at least in the states and i you know, i've seen too in you know western europe to get a new payment method to really take off and yeah pix is everywhere and so, but it does, but then it all, that also goes to show you though, that, you know, just like whenever we had an you know, EMV and chip and pin and all these things come about, oh, that's going to get rid of fraud. Well, it didn't get rid of fraud. It just shifted it. It changed it. And so that's kind of right back to that arms, arms dealer or arms race comes mm -hmm. that things change fast, but fraud, you know, the fraud changes with it. Yeah. Maybe one comment before we go into the next slide. I mean, in Europe where I'm based, everybody thought uh, PSD2 with 3DS is solving everything for fraud, but it's not the case, you know? I mean, uh, so that's, as God is mentioning, uh, it's, a, it's a new topic, it's a new payment method, it's a new regulation, but, but still the fraudsters are fast and adaptable and really finding an avenue to conduct fraud, yeah? 
Yep. But I mean, I mean, that's why we are in the industry, because it's exciting and it never gets boring. And I think new co topics coming up. But also looking at the time, uh, I think it's exciting what we have seen so far. But let's go into something really tangible for the audience, Andre. I think we have now a technology slide, but it would be maybe useful for the audience if you, when you're explaining this, if you could combine this together with a use case, uh, maybe to really give to the audience something really hands-on, how is this applying, what are the issues, that you really get like one story, how is this happening? Sounds good. By the way, just to take a step back here on, on the PICS uh, conversation, um, one, one thing that was quite interesting and, and um, is in line with what we were talking recently here uh, is that the central bank, after uh, seeing those, those attacks, the, those physical attacks happening, uh, they, they implemented this rule in which um, the limits go down at, automatically at night. Uh, basically, what happened was the fraud has shifted, right? So, so those attacks are now happening, happening during the, the, the light of the day. Um, so, so it's very hard to, to attack these type of problems uh, if you don't have a, a smarter way to understand, for example, the user behavior and then understand if the user is, for example, in a safer environment uh, to perform cer certain transactions. So, so that's why uh, lo location can play such an important difference, right? Because you can identify, well, if, if this person is at home, uh, the likelihood that a fraudster has like decided to break into that home to, to steal that device is much lower because the risk is significantly higher than if they're doing this outside, for example, right? So um, just wanted to, to add a little bit about that. Um, here on the on the technology, um, basically we, we, we do three things in, in, uh, in this very specific order. The first thing here is the device integrity checks. So first of all, we wanna make sure uh, that there is no um, like configuration on that device or we, we don't detect anything that is uh, potentially risky. So for example, detecting emulators, detecting the use of instrumentation tools or app tampering. Uh, this is extremely important. Also detecting if the device is root, rooted or jailbroken uh, is important. Not necessarily uh, this, this is directly linked to fraud, but the risk is, is higher. So for example, I'm not a fraudster, but my device is jailbroken just because I, I'm interested in, in hacking and stuff. Um, but, but I can still use most of my, uh, most of my, my applications with it. Um, so this is the first layer, right? So you need to make sure that you can trust that device. You, you need to make sure that uh, the data that you're receiving is trustworthy. So that's why the device integrity checks is, is important. On top of that, uh, what what we we do then is to analyze if there is any application on that device uh, that is on one of our watch lists uh, for for location spoofing. So, for example, we we have a database of like multiple location spoofing applications that this database is being updated every single day. If we detect one of those apps on 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 that device, we know that the likelihood that location spoofing is going on is is extremely high, right? So so this is the first layer uh, the second thing then is to analyze the sensors of that device so as i've mentioned we can analyze like gps wi-fi bluetooth many other signals um, and and if there is a mismatch between for example the bluetooth signals or the wi-fi signals with the gps coordinates we know that gps spoofing is going on right so for example if if my phone here um, like if, if the gps coordinates of my phone says that I'm on the East Coast, but we're seeing this Wi-Fi here, which is located in California. We saw we we know that something is 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 wrong, right? So so understanding and analyzing the the data from the sensors of the device is is also extremely important. And then finally, uh, we we have what we we call our watch list, right? So uh, there there are basically two types of watch lists here. Uh, the first one. Are, are related to the devices. So we also have our device ID technology. Uh, if we detect that a certain device was spoofing location previously, that's already a, a risk signal. If we've seen that device involved in, in, a, in a bigger uh, fraudulent activity, we're going to also um, 
detect that device and say, well, this device was in involved in fraud before. So this is when the network effects become important, right? So as we are embedded in many different uh, applications from like payments companies to gaming companies to banks, um, we have a lot of visibility. We usually have more visibility than, than the company uh, that is using our service, right? So if we see that someone was committing fraud on a food delivery app, once we detect them trying to, to open a banking application, we already know that there is uh, some risk associated with that. So that's basically the standard device ID, device fingerprinting uh, that, that most companies already do and have access to. Uh, but then on top of that, there is what we call the behavior watch list, which is related to location and network signals, right? So for example, if we saw that uh, like there was fraudulent activity associated to an, a Wi-Fi network, even though we're seeing a new device that looks clean, but that new device is connected to that Wi-Fi network or is near that Wi-Fi router, uh, we already know that there is some risk involved, right? Same applies to location. Even if it's a clean device that we have no like uh, bad information about it yet, uh, but that device is located at a place that was part of fraudulent activity before, we're also going to detect that. And for this part specifically, this is when location precision matters. Why? Because if you're relying, for example, only on the IP addresses or the GPS information, uh, basically it, it is not precise enough to locate the very specific place in which that phone is located, right? So for example, let's say that we have detected fraudulent activity in a place that is in a, in a high rise building in New York, New York City, right? In which like hundreds of people live in that same building. What would happen is if we were relying on, on GPS based information here, we would probably block everybody that lives in that same building but they have nothing to do with fraud, right? They, they, they didn't commit anything. They just happened to live nearby a fraudster. Um, so this is why location precision matters because if you're going to use it to block a, a person, if you're going to use it to block a, a device for a specific location, uh, you wanna make sure that the, the location information is super, super precise. So you wanna block that specific apartment uh, within that building instead of the entire building. So. So that's that's another thing we do, like uh, because as we know, fraudsters are always trying to find different ways to to do what they do, including switching devices, buying new phones. Like in many cases, it's it's worth the the money, right? Just buying multiple phones to commit uh, fraud uh, uh, all the time. So so even if your device ID technology uh, doesn't detect that phone because it's new. Um, location will enable you to, to identify that there is a, a very high risk of fraud. Scott, for, from your side, from your experience or talking to, to merchants, uh, anything to add? Well, I'm just going to say, I think that really just goes back to what you know, I've talked about probably for 20 years now, is that multiple layers matter, right? You can't rely on just one thing because one Generally, one thing is beatable, you know, so it used to be, you know, a long time ago, IP was everything. And, we, you know, we use IP and, hey, if that IP address had a charge back, you don't take the charge next time. But, you know, now there's so much IP sharing, you can't do that. And I think it's almost, it's coming to that like, with, like you know, Andre is sort of like device ID, you know, okay, so it's a new device. It's so easy to get new devices now. It's not like it's a computer that costs thousands of dollars. So... You can have a thousand, you know, 20 different phones, or you can have emulators like you talked about, all sorts of different technologies there that kind of defeat just device ID alone. And so then, you know, I, I like to look at it really holistically and that, you know, you're going to have, you need to have, and I think most merchants that are any good at this at all do that. I mean, you've got your device IDs, you have your, whatever you have in-house in your application, you know, especially if you have an app on the phone, you have access to a lot of these, some of these, these features. And then you use, you know, a third party app that has or third party service that has, you know, access to tons of different um, different merchants, different data points. Um, so, you know, so I think that that it all makes sense. But you always have to layer, you know, you, you never really want to rely on just one variable or one tool or one device to make any decision. 
you know, especially ones like this, because it can cost you so much. Perfect. Uh, I mean, uh, we have a few minutes left, so I think we should really wrap it up right now. But maybe we should take one question, Andre. Uh, one question came up from Amit. Uh, is the mobile app based SDK solution or is it remotely hosted? I would assume it's an SDK, but maybe we can give a short yep. overview to Amit. And um, so it's an SDK based solution. Exactly. It is an asset based solution. Uh, we need to make sure that it's coming from that device specifically. That's why we need the SDK. Yeah. And maybe maybe Scott can uh, maybe start from your point, Scott. Um, any recommendations, any major takeaways from, from your side? Uh, when a merchant will look about location spoofing, is there any kind of uh, shortcut, any kind of low-hanging fruits, how to get started? Maybe it gives your uh, advice here, and then we can uh, round this up also with Andrew. Thank you. Sure. I think, well, you know, really like just, I just said a minute ago is that you know, when you're talking about location, if you're on mobile, you have access to all these tools. You know, are yours going to be as good as a, a, as a company that focuses on or no? But there's no reason why to, you know, really quickly grab some of those variables and use those. Um, you know, definitely, and you can still use IP. You know, I always like to talk about like, run to the low hanging fruit. What's the quickest, easiest thing to do? So if you have nothing else, use IP and a couple other variables like your fraud screening tool, device ID. A lot of device ID providers include a location. Now it's not as advanced as what we're talking about here, but it does have things in it like, um, you know, some simple variables like, like the browser, right? If you're on a, a, a computer in a browser, you can get say language of the browser, maybe language of OS, um, you know, look for the things you can do just to start, right? It's just like, you know, there's, there's always something you can try, do some things like that. Um, but then in the end, you really are going to want to have, I think, a, a third party solution that, that focuses on it. Cause you know, we just, it's always best just like, you know, when you're looking at your, at your job, right. You know, you can do all the jobs, but you're only really good at what you do. And I think that's true of every, of every company too. Like I've worked with a lot of, a lot of video game companies and they're great at building games. They're not great at creating ant fraud solutions. They're not great at creating location solutions. So why would we do that? Let's use the experts. Thanks, Scott. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say a few things here. Uh, I, I totally agree with, with what Scott just said. Um, like, you have to take a layered approach to this. Uh, it, it's like there's no silver bullet in, in this industry. Uh, so, so you, you have to combine as many signals, as many authentication factors as possible, as long as you also don't create a user experience that is impossible for people to use your, your application. So you, you have to find a balance there. Um, but, but ideally, uh, you, you build a, a fraud prevention stack that uh, as a first layer, uh, you, you analyze some passive signals. So device ID, location. IP information, like everything that you can gather uh, without any specific action from the user. Uh, it's it's ideally that you, you analyze that first. And then based on that, uh, you have a pretty good understanding of the level of risk involved in that transaction. And based on that, you can define how much friction you're going to introduce the user experience, right? So if you identify that there is significant risk involved, you should add as many authentication factors as you can uh, so, so you make sure that that's the, the right person. But if you identify that there is low risk associated with, with that transaction, for example, the user is using the same device that you always use. The user is at a location that they frequently go. Um, the likelihood that this is a fraudster is much lower. So you can provide a much better user experience for, for that situation, right? So I think all of this is very situational um, and, and, and you, you build your, your, um, fraud prevention stack based on, on this contextual information uh, so you can find the balance between user experience and, uh, and security. Um, when it comes to location specifically, as we've, we've seen here, location spoofing is very accessible to fraudsters. So uh, if, if you want to rely on location signals to, to protect your, your application, ideally you would also use uh, some, some strong location spoofing detection technology so you can trust the location data you're using 
for for your fraud prevention models, right? Um, and then uh, finally, here uh, just uh, uh, my my last recommendation uh, is very simple. If if you're not using location, you should be using uh, if especially if if you you have a mobile application. Um, and, and I think Apple um, has has sent that message to to everyone, right? As as I've mentioned before, Apple has access to the best device identifiers because they own the hardware. Uh, Apple has access to some of the best uh, biometric authentication technology using Face ID, and they still decided to employ location as a mandatory fraud prevention signal. So I think that sends a, a powerful message to, to the whole industry that if we're not using it yet, you should be using, but if you're, you're going to use, make sure you have good location spoofing detection technology. I think that's a good uh, summary, Andrew. Thanks a lot. Um, we're running already uh, late, uh, so I really would like to wrap this up now. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to Andre and Scott for sharing all the insights, sharing perspective. Again, we're trying to make this as educational as possible with many examples as possible to really give uh, to the broader audience some use cases. Again, everybody's different. Everybody has different pain points or different pots which uh, a fraudster wants to get. So everybody needs to really look about these different layers and different technology to really see what makes sense in which stage of a process or which stage of an application um, to really use the, the right information and to make the right decisions at the end of the day. So again, also to the audience, thank you uh, for joining today. It was very exciting to have you on board. Um, the uh, webinar is recorded, so if you want to go back, um, you get an email, you can also go to our website abovefraud.com where you can see the recording. Uh, again, thank you to everybody and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.